Today uh, we'll have McLean, so sorry for that. <laughs> I still cannot manage to say your name properly. So Michael is a staff member of the nuclear department of the laboratory, IRFU CEA at Sakli. He started his career in ELIS, uh, doing a PhD in JPLAP site production in PLED collisions in 2016. He then moved to the LHCB, serving as the LHCB representative for the yellow report on high LUMI and high energy LHC uh, for the physics opportunities at the heavy ions working group, and also as convener for the ion and fixed target physics. Now he's back to LIS, uh, acting as convener of Corconium and the Lepton working group. So Michael has worked uh, in several experimental analyses related to heavy quarks, so upsilon, B-mesons, JPS, I, and also some theory contributions that, that are very uh, highly cited in the framework of the hadron resonance gas and dilepton production in lead lead collisions. So today he kindly agreed to present an overall picture of tremorium production in uh, heavy ion collisions at the LHC. So Michael, once again, thank you very much for <laughs> accepting our invitation. So please, you start, you can start whenever you want. Okay, thanks a lot for the kind invitation. Before starting, um, I see quite a number of, of experts so that are particularly known for polarization. So I hope I will not deceive them. I will focus on kind of standard picture of shamonium production and not so much on very specific aspects that we can discuss in the question. So, um, so I will talk about shamonium production and nuclear collisions at the LHC. And uh, the first one, so let's see, uh, I will give an introduction to the topic, uh, motivating quark gluon plasma physics at the LHC. Then I will talk about the measurements and the interpretations in charmonium production nucleus nucleus collisions, then a bit on uh, potential, po potential possibilities to discriminate between different scenarios, and then come to conclusion outlook. Um, okay, so let's go. So then, this is an event display of nucleus nucleus collision at recorded by the Alice time projection chamber. So it's a 90 cubic meter gases detector at the LHC. And within this gas one, you reconstruct about 4,000 uh, tracks, a bit more. Um, and um, the question is why we do this, because experimentally, it's a very challenging environment uh, to, to do this kind of messy uh, production of particles. And the reason is that we use this kind of macroscopic objects collisions, so these nuclei that are here Lorentz contracted and have a length, transverse length scale about 10 Fermi in order to produce, uh, in terms of uh, compared to the scale of a proton macroscopic system of thermodynamic matter that can be well described like in this cartoon film and visualization of hydrodynamic simulations where the hydrodynamics and uh, we try to, to test basically these hydrodynamic systems that should be governed by quantum chromodynamics with models and try to learn about this. And uh, what kind of system is this? So this, is, um, this can, be, can be explained by looking at uh, state-of-the-art theory calculations. And what you look here at is the pressure over temperature to the fourth power, which is a dimensionless quantity in these units as a function of temperature and you see in blue a lattice QCD calculation, you see at high temperatures that you have a description that coincides with something which can be done in perturbative QCD or with free summations uh, where you have quarks and gluons as degrees of freedom and at low temperatures you have a gas of hadrons and uh, resonances that can describe this uh, the equation of state quite well. And what is marked in this plot here in red is basically the temperature range that according to hydrodynamic simulation we probe with our collisions at the LHC, whereas we start the system at high temperatures and then due to the expansion of the system, it will cool down and eventually will, will transform to, to hadrons. And the goal is to characterize this transition, which is actually quite smooth and to see um, what we can learn about this in, in looking at different observance in high, heavy ion collisions. So this is the overall goal of this uh, strong experimental program that has been started already at relativistic heavy ion collider at, for relativistic heavy ion collisions and even before and fixed target collisions at the SP, SPS and AGS. And um, one way to look, one of the very interesting questions is in 
particular to which extent actually we have a direct observation of of the confinement in this collision what does it mean so usually hadrons um, are color neutral objects and the QGP is in fact a meta state of quarks and gluons where they can free roamly and how do we have a direct access to probe this so what we can do is we can put into the system a uh, test test system which which could be used for this and one one uh, very good way to do this uh, is if you think about uh, putting a very heavy quark and anti-quark together and look at the interaction between them and the nature the best realization of this um, test system is heavy quarkonium where you have bound state of a heavy quark and anti-quark so cc bar and the bb bar and this um, the interaction between this uh, two um, two quarks has a has a potential, and this potential can be described with something which is at short distances like a, a Coulomb-like interaction, which appropriate color factors, and then will transition to a string tension that is related to the fact that the more and more you pull out the two quarks, you will have to invest more and more energy. Um, and uh, so, so in here in, in blue, you see different kind of shamonium states, which give the rough uh, range of the distance of these bound states within this um, potential. And this is a picture at temperature equal zero. So one question to ask is what happens if you increase the temperature and um, this modification of the potential that is expected due to color screening, but also in, due to medium induced uh, dissociation has been a topic of heavy ion physics uh, since a long time, because uh, you would like to, to I mean, the, the, the modification of this potential and also of um, the overall quark anti quark interaction may show up in uh, modification of production of heavy quarkonium and heavy ion collisions compared to production that you would expect uh, from uh, without the presence of a QGP. And there's a very consequent theory effort that I will not talk about in details, I will talk more about experimental results and rather simple models for very qualitative pictures and what where we are but it's it's a very consequent um, theory effort that goes into this and uh, I, I can point to this very nice review by Alexander Rutkov that discusses the the um, heavy quarkonium under extreme conditions and the progresses that have been made that in particular um, have been applied to upsilon uh, production so beauty antibutum quark pair which is in some respect theoretically easier to deal with due to the larger mass scale. But I will focus here on shamonium, which is also very interesting and uh, which comes also with a very new future at the LHC, which is the main topic of this talk. So before coming to the results, I would like to, to explain a little bit what, what, what we can actually measure. Um, um, so this is so these shamonium bound states. We have seen a couple of them in this potential. What we can realistically measure until now is are the vector states because these vector states they decay with good probability to a lepton anti lepton pair, and uh, leptons are rather rare objects in heavy ion collisions. And despite the fact that you have these thousands of tracks, you will be able to reconstruct them with an invariant mass peak. Um, these kind of candidates, which is much more difficult if you have a hadronic decay channel where you will have a large combinatorial background from building these candidates from pions or kaons or other particles that are more abundant in the collision. So these are the two states that you usually look at and they can be accessed. However, when we look at them, they will be composed of a couple of um, I mean, they will not, if we look at shape psi production, which is the biggest peak in this dilepton uh, invariant mass range, that is the shamonium range, um, you will have several contributions that will contribute to the production of shamonium. So you will have production of weakly decaying B quarks uh, that will travel quite a while and then there will be a decay. So this we won't uh, discuss uh, in detail. We will treat mostly inclusive like prompt production which is a good approximation for the low transverse momentum range that we will mostly discuss. And then we had the prompt production is, is um, subdivided into production from direct shape psi, the one from P wave states and psi to S. Also this one has to be treated in the models. I will not explain this explicitly, but this is something that uh, models have to take into account and that, that, uh, that also do this. 
And these are the rough fractions at low transverse momentum in a proton proton collisions that we usually have at, uh, at the LEC or at uh, high energy colliders. So this is the kind of observer that we can look at. So we can look at this production of inclusive shape sign. This will have this composition and the models will have to deal with this kind of thing. The fact that you have these feed down contributions can lead also to distinct features and observed patterns. So um, it's coming back to the original idea of what I was already mentioning this reference was that you can observe suppression of shape size. So that simply the QGP uh, destroys or prevents the quaconium to form. And this will lead to a weaker production of more less frequent production of quaconium bound set compared to what you would expect uh, from, uh, from, uh, PQC, uh, from PQCD based models and then uh, measurements that you have in proton proton collisions. And um, this has been brought forward. And in fact, what you could also do is um, since you have this feed down chain, when you look at the inclusive shape psi, you could think of, okay, maybe there are some states that melt earlier and that you will first suppress them at lower temperatures. And if you go higher in temperature, uh, you, would, um, you would suppress them also and temperature you might may be capable to deal in experimentally. And then you would see a sequential melting scenario. And this has been also proposed early on. And then you would use this quaconium as a temperature scales. This is uh, this is an overlying picture that has driven large experimental programs, and this was the starting point for the studies. However, at the LHC, and this is I will try to convince you in the following slides that this is actually what is driving at least at low transverse momentum. Um, the story is that you have a competing effect, namely that um, at the LHC the charm quark densities are very large that you produce, so you have a very large, uh, let's say charm cross section that goes in and uh, once once they are then implanted into the QGP they are produced early um, with large abundance they they will roam freely within uh, within this quark lumen plasma and they may meet each other and form bound states and this was an idea that was brought up around 2000 and this is the idea that we want to test and in principle it's something that is larger production than from the suppression status that you would expect is a scenario that is also a signature of the confinement because these objects, the quaconia states, and uh, are very small. And on the hadronic scale, it would be very difficult to produce them by hadron hadron scatterings. So this would be also a very direct signature of QGP and has been proposed at the LHC as dominant production mechanism. This kind of production comes in two flavors. So one way is to say, okay, this kind of late state production from this uh, free charm quarks only happens at the very last stage of uh, the collision. So then you basically just have the number of charms that you have given in the beginning of the collision, and then you give them, uh, then you uh, distribute them among the different states that you have under your disposal. So the singly heavy quark uh, states and the double heavy quark states or anti quark quark states. And the only thing that you have as a free parameter is basically this fugacity factor that 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 makes this equation work and it comes with a square for the for for the shamonium state so that means that your everything is fixed at the moment where you have a transition at a fixed temperature to hadrons and this then produces your quaconia at a very late stage alternatively you can have a production of this dynamically uh, production, destruction and production of Quaconia dynamically. And then you have a rate equation that governs this. So this is just integrated Boltzmann equation where you have a loss term, the uh, destruction of Quaconia, which is similar what you have, uh, which would give a, also a sequential melting scenario. But here you have also gain term that comes in. And this gain term also can bring up if the charm densities are large, you can bring up a larger yield than what you would expect if you would just have this suppression factor. And both of these model types were, were, uh, were already very early on proposed. And this is what we usually uh, compare with our data. Um, and uh, we will see how this works out. Okay, so this, this is the, um, the very basic introduction of this. Um, so now when we come to the experimental uh, measurements of, of Charmonium at the LHC, what is interesting for this 
observations of thermal production or close to thermal production with these transport equations, which are having using transfer, uh, using um, concepts from uh, from transport theory. What we need is basically that that we measure the um, the quaternion in a, in a transverse momentum range that is uh, that is uh, close to its thermal distribution, and the temperature is very small compared to the uh, is rather small. It's 150 MeV at the freeze out. It's a bit higher earlier on, but this means that we need to measure the Charmonia at rather low transverse momentum, and this is why for most of the time I will concentrate on Ali's result for the nucleus nucleus part simply because. In nucleus nucleus collisions, most of the results on charmonium are, are distributed at low transverse momentum. So you see here uh, a plane of transverse momentum reach versus rapidity. So you have the forward detectors uh, here at the right, and then your mid rapidity you have on the left. And you see that the two ALIS measurements reach down to zero transverse momentum. Atlas and CMS are at higher transverse momentum, very performant, uh, much more precise than the ALIS measurements. But they don't reach here to low momentum, in particular for CMS, one could hope that in the future one, one could try to push this lower, um, although this is challenging. Uh, so this will be the, I will focus on this low transverse momentum part in the following and therefore also on Alice. So just um, since I will mainly discuss experimental results, I will um, present a, a few details on the experimental setup. So. At the LEC, you have a collider experiment. So you have a beam coming in from one side and the beam from the other side, they meet at the interaction point. And then from this interaction end, you have this large number of particles produced. And then you try to figure out the, the JSI peak or the quaconium peak. And in Alice, you have two detection ways. So one is the, the dimuons that go forward into the muon spectrometer. So this is a, a five station muon uh, spectrometer with a dipole magnetic uh, field of uh, free Tesla meter, and then a trigger system behind an additional filter. And everything is behind an absorber that is close to the interaction point to, to reduce the, the, um, to filter out the pions and other hadrons that you have produced mostly in the collisions. And this, by this, you can access uh, low transverse momentum in this full rapidity range. In addition to this, we have also measurement with the ALICE time projection chamber and the inner tracking system, so silicon detector that is used for secondary vertexing. And the time projection chamber is a very challenging measurement because you have to identify the electrons in this among this very large number of particles that you have seen on the on the second slide. And what you do is you cut basically out in this in this DDX plot, so the beta Bloch energy loss of the particles. You cut out this part here. Uh, on the right hand side of the protons and above the pions in order to get your electrons. And this is a very delicate thing and it's not so easy, but so far it worked for the heavy, de heavy ion data takings and this provides this, um, this measurements at low transverse momentum. Okay, so to give you a flavor of the signal extraction of this kind of measurements so on the left hand side you see the muons the lower two panels are low transverse momentum so here you see that the background conditions are not so, so nice at higher transverse momentum there's much less background as you see here on the lower panel and what is done is that you that you mimic the background by mixed event techniques where you combine a muon from one event with a muon from the other event and then you after this mixed event background, you are left off with a very nice peak that you then fit with a crystal ball function or other functions. And on the right hand side, you see the same for the mid rapidity result, where you can see that you can barely see this shape psi peak at 3 GeV by I. Uh, and only after the mixed event subtraction, you are able to, to actually, to actually uh, recognize that there is a resonance in, in this uh, distribution. And um, and this is then used in order to all to all these uh, um, measurements that I will show in the following. So I will most of the time discuss it uh, with the so-called nuclear modification factor. Very broadly speaking, what you do is you normalize the yield, so the number of your observable divided by the number of events in nucleus nucleus collisions, by your naive expectation from proton proton collisions where you have one factor that accounts for the geometry, um, where you have um, 
the average number in in a given uh, the average number of binary collisions divided by the nucleo the nucleo nucleo inelastic cross section, and in lead lead collisions you can actually measure also the uh, the impact parameter indirectly and dial in centrality so you can control how many nucleons roughly uh, participate in the collisions. Whereas in proton lead you can do the same. I will show some proton lead results. And in absence of nuclear effects, um, uh, so if you if a nucleus nucleus collisions is a simple superposition of proton proton collisions, you end up uh, with something which uh, which should be one. And here you see one example for charged particles. So you see a very strong suppression in central. So in in a large number of colliding nucleons, participating nucleons, and large number of colliding nuclei, very strong suppression. So this is a signature of QGP. You have a, a suppression of particles at high transverse momentum. And in proton lead collisions, you see something which is close to one. So this is just one example. And we will use the same type of observable to quantify modifications of quaconium production relative to your expectation from proton-proton collisions, which is one way to illustrate uh, the measurements that we will show. So um, this is a measurement of the nuclear modification factor as a function of centrality. So most central collisions is on the right hand side. And you see a comparison with measurements at lower beam energies in blue, where you see a decreasing trend, which, uh, which would make sense in a suppression scenario. In most central collisions, you would have uh, uh, more and more JPSI suppressed. But however, what you see at the LEC, so in these two measurements at mid-rapidity by Alice, is that you don't see this decreasing trend, but you see rather something central. And okay, for the 5TV data set, you may even think of if there is something increasing, although the uncertainties are very, very large. But you see that there's qualitative something different. So this is at mid rapidity with this challenging environment of the TPC. If you measure this with the muon arm, you can also compare at lower beam energies where you see the same picture where this suppression gets stronger and stronger and stronger in, uh, in at, uh, at the relativistic heavy ion collide at 0 0.2 TeV, whereas at, in the Alice energy, this stays constant, which, which, has, uh, which can be well described by current model calculations both findings that include this non-primordial JPSI production, which fills up this production um, uh, compared to lower beam energies by, by this JSI that are regenerated at a later stage. You can also look at the rapidity dependence. So here you basically integrate all the points that you have seen on the two previous slides to form one point at mid rapidity and different several points at forward rapidity. And you see also here that the suggestion of uh, rapidity of an increase of this nuclear modification as a function of rapidity. And this is also very naturally explained in this scenario because the first approximation, the number of quaconia that you produce goes with the square of the charm density and this charm density is higher at, uh, at mid rapidity. So, so this is uh, about the nuclear modification factor as a function of transverse momentum and centrality. And the last point that I would like to show is uh, same kind of observable as a function of transverse momentum. And as I was saying, these are rather effects that show up at low transverse momentum. And here you see that, that you see indeed this increase of this contribution um, of an additional contribution at LEC energies and something which is flat at lower beam energies. And this is, can also be naturally explained in this kind of combination pictures where this new production source shows up at low transverse momentum. So this was the discussion of these nuclear modification factors that all point into these qualitative predictions from these models. I would to show just one other observable in nucleus-nucleus collisions, which is uh, elliptic flow. Um, so in, in non-central heavy ion collisions, we, we start off with a kind of almond shape interaction region. And what has been observed is that in this kind of collisions, you have a very strong modulation of the of, of soft particle emission with respect to symmetry plane that you can define, which goes with cosine two phi, where phi is the angle of the soft particle with respect to the symmetry plane. And this you can also see in dihadron correlations and multi-particle hadron correlations. And this coefficients you call V2. And this is today understood as uh, the transmutation of 
um, this initial coordinate space asymmetry to a momentum space asymmetry in the final state. And this, um, this transmutation uh, is one of the very effective ways to quantify the, the hydrodynamic expansion of the system and to, to get constraints on this very precise measurement of these correlations. For Charmonium, the question is, does this show also this V2? Does this also correlate with the soft particle protection? So does it somewhat participate in this collective motion, which would be indicative of, of partial thermalization? And this is uh, by now also very well measured. Um, is something that that uh, have only been possible to come into evidence with uh, with the run two data up to with very good precision. So here also we do the same kind of signal extraction and mass. We we get uh, parameterization of the background and the signal, um, and then with these weights of signal and background, we are able to to do on a statistical basis an extraction of the V two of this coefficient for signal and background and extract this for, for JPSI at forward rapidity, where you see that it's, it's rather a nice signal, and also at mid rapidity, where it's more challenging due to this very large background. And what you get, I show here only the forward rapidity results, but there is a very uh, extensive comparison also uh, with, with different particles and at mid rapidity measurement you see a very significant V2, and you see also that at low transverse momentum, this can be well described by this recombination model. There's some PT range, which is not well described, which, which is still uh, puzzling. But overall, qualitatively, at least you see a very large V2 that is very difficult to explain if, uh, if not this shape side participates in this collective motion. So this is, um, this is the picture that we have. Um, however, if we look, um, uh, further, we okay. We can also look further by look having more precise measurements. So on the left hand side, you see um, preliminary data that is hopefully soon released in the coming in the coming year, where you see a very precise PT dependence at mid rapidity compared with the same at forward rapidity and extending also type PT in the range where you have overlap with CMS and Atlas, and you see very nice agreement with these different data sets. But uh, what is a bit uh, bothering, let's say, is that um, these kind of findings you can you can be well described with these two different type of models. So with this transport model that generates shape psi and destructs shape psi during the whole lifetime of the medium, as well as with the statistical hadronization model. So you see here, for instance, this blue and this reddish corner. But if you go into the details of the models, what you will find is in order to describe these data, you will have to trigger the charm cross section that controls everything, um, you have to vary it by a factor two. And however, we have not sufficiently precise measurement to tell, basically to tell the model builders wait, uh, you cannot use this cross section. So at the moment, this is the common uncertainty uh, that drives this and allows to describe with both models the data, although in principle, we have a discriminator that should be good enough because if we would fix this charm cross section, then then uh, we can we can nail down what is a more appropriate picture. So uh, what what to do then next is um, one way is to measure this charm cross section in some way. I will comment on this. The other way is to measure the excited state that I was uh, so far. I was only talking about shape psi, and you can here show this is the nuclear modification factor of psi to s over the one of shape psi. And you see that here is quite a large difference so that the value of the statistical model is much smaller than the one of the transport model. And here, this kind of uh, charm input drops out. And this is very difficult to move this, uh, this prediction here uh, a lot. And uh, you, you would, would, be, uh, would be a good discriminator between the two models, maybe also different even between the two, the two times things. So for what concerns the Psi to S, uh, at the moment, there is this publication here on the left-hand side. There's also preliminary data from, from RUN2, which has similar precision, uh, which does not allow to draw any conclusions because of the large uncertainties. The CMS points at slight forward rapidity, you can go into a region that starts to be very interesting also for this physics. However, also here, we are not yet really in the position to, to say a lot because this stretches basically all the possibilities that might be uh, interesting for this discrimination. So 
This is also measurement that is under preparation. Let's see if we have it out next year for a major conference of our field for quark matter, and then we may be able to put a point here with, with a proper aqua bar. So um, the other way is that we can constrain the charm production directly. And here, what I show is first measurement in proton-proton collisions, because it's very important for this context. If you want to measure it in lead-lead collisions, um, uh, what, what you have to recognize that in proton-proton collisions, we see in Alice a very large component. If you look at this ratio of the charm baryon measured to the D0, which is the easiest measured uh, particle, is a very large component of the baryons, so of lambda C, much larger than what you would expect from E plus E minus, which is the first approximation uh, modeled by this, by this uh, magenta curve. So if you want to measure this in heavy, in heavy ion collisions, you will need to measure also the baryons. And these baryons are very difficult to measure because they have very small lifetimes. So the lambda C has a, uh, something like a 60 micrometers lifetime in this very crowded environment. So this is very difficult to measure. And therefore, this is, this is not yet uh, feasible to have really these particles uh, to sufficiently precision to really put a very good measurement up but it's one of the major goals of the upgrades. And there are also some measurements on the way that will constrain this a little bit. So instead of measuring directly, what we can do, we can take the proton-proton measurement that is here already done very precisely and try to extrapolate to let lead collisions. So this is one way to go. Uh, but then we have to know what is different in lead lead collisions. And one natural thing, the most trivial change is that the pattern densities are different because these quarks that we produce are mainly produced by gluons as here also be it PP, PLED or LED-LED. And one way to do it, because we have the net nucleus to constrain then uh, indirectly uh, charm production led lead collisions is to measure it simply heavy flavor or charm production in uh, PLED collisions, proton lead collisions, and then transform this into constraint into nuclear pattern densities, and then apply this to our nucleus nucleus case. Another way to do it is to look into exclusive photo production of, again, shapes I, which is the largest signal that we have in order to try to get and constrain the handle on this. Um, so I will talk a little bit about, very quickly about proton LED. This is an environment that on average looks much more like a proton-proton collisions, which is something like three times the average multiplicity of proton-proton. So it's something where we can have very precise measurements. And in fact, I just take one example here is a nuclear modification factor, just uh, this what I defined before. And you see here also small modifications, but very significantly measured. And you see also that the measurement precision here and these two points measured by LACB is much better than the error bars of this nuclear PDF prediction that you have. So in principle, if this uh, modification that we see here comes from nuclear modifications of PDFs, we can constrain by these measurements the nuclear PDF, the gluon density and the nucleus to good precision, and then uh, turn this into a prediction of, uh, of charm production in nucleus nucleus collisions. On the right hand side, so this has been done. So there has been reweights of nuclear PDFs with PLET data. On the right hand side, you see one example where uh, D meson is used for a reweight, and you see the original nuclear PDF ratio that you have. Uh, is this gray area, which is a huge error band. So basically spends a factor two. Um, and then with this measurement constraint, you, you narrow it down to, to much smaller bands. Then it depends on, on technicalities of how you do this, what you get exactly, but it narrows down already a lot. Um, so this, this is one way to go, but this comes with caveats. And the caveats are that there could be other effects. So for instance, most prominently, there could be something like cold nuclear energy loss that could produce this dilution, which is shown here on the left-hand side, uh, where it's compared to this B-meson data. On, um, and the other, uh, the other caveat is also that if you measure the D-meson ratio, I showed forward rapidity data, if you measure mid rapidity, there starts to be a slight tension between this uh, heavy flavor reweighted from PLET measurement with the latest measurements at mid rapidity it may point out to something that we don't understand yet what we are doing exactly. And there could be also harmonization modification. So also this lambda C ratio could play a role and could enter this, this ratios here. 
but this seems to be the Mylar effect because we start to have very precise measurements in proton, proton, and proton lead also in these baryons. So the other way is to look at ultra peripheral collisions. So here we have really only the, the signature of this uh, quaconium in the final state in our detector and nothing else. So it's uh, exclusive production. And this is um, uh, to at leading order, this can be described by basically two gluon exchange, so which is a, it's a pomeron. And um, formally, that is, uh, that is sensitive to something, to a different kind of object, which is generalized parton distribution functions. However, in, in the kinematic limit, which we are close to, this is um, proportional to the gluon PDF to the square. Um, so they are quite precise measurements on this by, by different collaborations. So for instance, here I took a publication from CMS where this point was added on top of these two points from Alice from the lower beam energies in round one of, of the LEC. And you see here that indeed, if you make a calculation that does not consider any nuclear effects, which would be the blue one, you don't describe at all the data and you see a large suppression. So you see also this long, this, this strong uh, depletion of patterns that you got also from these pilet collisions. That means that uh, you have some indications that indeed you have a strong depletion of this of these gluons, and uh, this this is not the end of the story because we have very precise results um, in um, in run one, but even more in run two. So this is a this is a publication from Alice, which is very recent, where you see. Um, the measurements at forward rapidity with the muon arm and the measurements at, at mid rapidity. And you see again, this, this consistently large difference between this, um, this uh, calculation without any nuclear modifications and the actual data, which you can, which you can uh, uh, account for if, if you take the ratio of these, uh, of these two values and you do the square root of it because PDF enters to the square, and then you get a suppression factor, which is just something like 0 0.65 for these gluons in this kinematic range, which is about uh, the Pjorken X range, which you're interested in also for charm production in nucleus nucleus, in inelastic nucleus nucleus collisions. Um, so there are, of course, caveats when doing this. Uh, this, this transition between this generalized pattern distribution functions and the PDFs is only limited in low X and T limit. And this is something which is addressed, but also we are here really at the edge of the applicability of PQCD to do a rigorous calculation to really translate this uh, and to, to, to do this. So um, here, uh, in basically um, one has to see if, if, uh, if better methods will allow to, to be more quantitative on the calculation to describe already the data, the calculation in order to be sure that we really, we can, we understand uh, what, what needs to be in the calculation to then make the transfer from this exclusive process to the inclusive process. Okay, so um, I think I'm uh, maybe a little bit faster, but I, I already come to the conclusion. So Shamonia, in fact, uh, uh, I hope uh, I could uh, motivate well that it's uh, quite direct observable for the confinement because um, you have this test system that you plug into the to the system and you see what happens with it. And um, we have this uh, secondary kind of production of quaconium that you see here on, for shamonium that you see here on this lower uh, cartoon that has been predicted for the LEC and that we think we see with this uh, with these patterns that I showed with the rapidity dependencies, with the PT dependence of this large elliptic flow and this strong interaction with the, with the created deconfined system. However, uh, we have these two kinds of scenarios where the statistical hadronization model is somewhat extreme scenario that where nothing is, uh, everything is fixed at the very end. Um, but at the moment, we don't have yet the precision to really exclude this extreme scenario and to go for this transport or vice versa. And there are, however, ways to experimentally discriminate between these. So one way is to measure Psi to S. This is something which is underway. And then we can also constrain the overall total charm. And this is something that is also being done and uh, is not yet uh, fully fully um, 
conclusive, but uh, will be will improve in the coming years such that we can really make the decision between uh, this, these two scenarios based on two independent inputs. For the outlook is what I was already saying that um, we will have new results on PSYCHOS quite soon uh, from Alice and also on the charm production, this very difficult baryon production and nucleus nucleus collisions will also be improved very soon with new data. And that will also allow them to narrow down the parameter space that the model builders can put into their model to describe the data and will hopefully lead us to, to, to say something about this. And when coming to the upcoming years, is uh, this can be even more uh, narrowed down because we will have a large increase of statistics for the heavy iron program that already starts in, in run three. For Alice, because the readout will change and we will be able for this TPC based uh, detector to go up by a factor 10. And also for the high PT probes for Atlas CMS and the muon arm of Alice, as well as um, uh, for, yeah, for these measurements, we go up by a factor 10. And also LECB upgrade will be interesting because uh, this detector will be more granular and may start to contribute as well. And then the fast two upgrades Atlas CMS will be also very interesting in terms of charm measurements. And this full program here of upgrades should allow to measure all of these ingredients that I was discussing much more in precision and then eventually develop a more refined picture when this kind of, uh, when of kind of regeneration is happening and uh, what, what is the proper time scale of this process and whether we have really non-prime, if we have JPSI only produced the phase boundary or if we have it already produced earlier in the collision. So thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you, Michael, for this very nice uh, overview of these results.